without further ado, we're going to jump into the first part, our keynote presentation sponsored by Brain Changes Initiative. And we're going to call up Dr. Patrick Quaid to the stage, uh, a renowned optometrist who's also had his own lived experience with traumatic brain injuries. And he's going to talk about the importance of vision therapy because he's dedicated a lot of his time and a lot of his life into creating more education and information about it. So Dr. Quaid, welcome. Thanks. Thank you for the invite. Uh, hopefully I'm loud enough. Um, I'm humbled by the invitation. If you excuse me, I just got back from Australia, so I was lecturing for two weeks there, so I'm still jet lagged. Um, I was honored to get the invite. Um, as an eye doctor, I cringe because this should be a way bigger screen for everybody to see. Um, but there's some QR codes. I'll make sure that uh, that that Seth and the gang get get the P, get the QR code out to you and the slides as well. So I'm going to try to talk today. You know, 25 to minutes to a half an hour is like a lot to fit in. So I'm going to not spend a lot of time on the research papers. I want to put them there in the PDF so they're there for you. I want to spend more time talking about um, why this is an important topic for me. Because whenever you have a talking head. You want to know why is the talking head up there talking to you about this? What's what's my angle on this? And and my angle on this is um, when I did my PhD, which I gently refer to as my poor homeless and destitute, because if you ever want to make money, do not become a grad student. Um, I wanted to learn about how the brain worked, uh, because during optometry school, so I'm, I'm Irish by birth. I trained in the UK, and you, and you'll notice every Irishman always says that if they train in the UK, they'll always clarify, but I'm Irish. Um, and then I, I worked in Murfield's Eye Hospital in the UK and also in uh, Bradford Royal Infirmary. And if anyone is here is familiar with the UK, they'll realize Bradford is like, uh, the campus is fantastic there, but the city is like the Bronx of the UK. It's a, it's a rough place. Um, so I learned a lot about trauma, concussions uh, when I worked in that role. Then I ended up coming to Canada to do my PhD. Uh, John Flanagan was my supervisor. He's now the dean out in Berkeley. And, and he really taught me evidence-based stuff. And I really, stuff, um, but I really started to appreciate the clinicians in the trenches. And I started to realize the clinicians work out what works first. And dare I say it, they throw, they throw poop on the wall to see what sticks. And when something sticks, they go, ooh, that's cool. Why did that stick? And they keep doing more of that, right? And eventually, what I noticed even at the University of Waterloo is eventually, five, 10 years later, the researchers would catch up and explain why, which is important. But the changes start with the clinicians. We're in the trenches with the patient. Necessity is the mother of invention, OK? So, so my story. Uh, whenever I pull up this slide, if you can't see it at the back, that's okay. It's just a whole bunch of stuff about my life. When people see this, they go, geez, you know, is this guy trying to compensate for something, right? And, and the reason why I put that up there is I was told I'd be lucky to finish school twice. At eight years old, I was in a car accident with my dad. I was knocked out of commission for two and a half years. I had a speech impediment because my SCMs contracted. My head went forward. My neck was a mess. Um, and I also saw a double. But guess what? The speech impediment got spotted because people could hear it. The vision issue got missed. And it, despite me holding my head off to the side to use my nose to block one eye so I didn't see two. And that was two and a half years. And I remember my mom was a nurse, my dad was in the army, and my dad took me to see an optometrist who did a very, very basic form of vision therapy um, to which nobody really understood what he was doing. But they said, hey, he's kind of kooky, but he does cool stuff. He fixes people. Um, so my dad took me to see this optometrist who was in the army. And I remember sitting in the chair, and the optometrist takes out a pen and says, have a look at the pen. And I just intuitively said, which one? I said, what do, what do you mean? I'm like, I see two. There's one here and one here. And he turns around to my dad and says, and you're wondering why you can't read. And I'm sitting there as an eight-year-old thinking like this. Oh, sorry, I was now 10 at that time. I was looking at this big towering guy going, you walk on water right now. Like, does this mean I'm not stupid? Because I struggled at school for two and a half years. I, th I literally thought I was stupid. And I'm pretty sure after a PhD and a postdoc, that ain't true, right? So um, being an Irishman, if you're Irish, if you can't quote Yeats or play a musical instrument, you're considered learning disabled. So... Yates, education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. Education is not about getting initials after your name. It's about doing something that you're passionate about and being able to, yes, derive an income, but do something that you love that benefits society. To me, that's the nirvana that we all, that we all look for, right? So this has been a 25-year journey for me that has taken me through three countries. Um, if any of you have not read this brain, if any of you have not read this book, you should, Phantoms in the Brain, uh, Ramit Chandran, he's an MD, PhD out of San Diego, I think. My PhD was based on his work. So if, so if I say I did my, my PhD in psychophysics, how many people think that sounds exciting? Psychophysics, like really? Okay. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. But most people are like, nah. Um, if I say I did my PhD in illusions, that sounds really cool. Okay? So what Ramachandran did, he, he basically looked into phantom limb pain. So the reflection of the arm in the mirror, if you haven't seen his TED Talk, you should really watch it. It's phenomenal. 
um, he managed to significantly reduce, if not eliminate, phantom limb pain by using a mirror box. Think about that. That's visual, folks. Half of your brain is visual machinery, 40 to 50%, depending on the paper that you read. Vision is by far your most dominant sensory system. So the reason why illusions fascinated me and the reason why I came to Canada to, to do my PhD starting in 2002, and I remember getting off the plane in jeans and a t-shirt on January the 5th. That was stupid. I'm like, what have I done? Right? I just walked away from a hospital gig in the UK. Um, so illusions are very powerful in that they can reveal kinks in the armor of sensory processing systems that are very useful to know. Now, the fact that we're using a small screen might be a problem here, because if this was a big screen, this illusion would work phenomenally, but it'll probably work for you in the front row. Back row, I'm not as sure. So this is called the furrow illusion, very well-known one. But if you look at the blue star, so don't look anywhere but at the blue star. I'm going to show a red dot. As you're looking at the blue star, don't move your eye yet. Keep looking at the blue star. Which way is the dot moving? Diagonal, right? So it's going this way. Now, switch your fixation to the dot now. Ooh. Now, let's go. We'll, we'll do it again. Again, at the back, it might not work because it has to be a big screen. So if you're looking at the star, it's moving diagonal, up and to the left, down to the right. Now switch fixation to the dot. And the kicker is, even though you know it's an illusion, you can't inhibit it. And it's because the pattern, the high contrast black and white lines, are overriding your, per, your, your perception of motion. So these are the types of things that I went through. So I'm more interested in what the brain constructs, which is vision rather than eyesight. So I differentiate between eyesight and my ability to... So what I see on the eye chart, and we'll, and we'll, we'll get into that, because one's brain, one is basically the retina. And if you know anything about sports, and I'm sorry, I'm not an... I'm not, a, I'm not a mad football fan. I'm, I follow it enough to know that the Argonauts are, are dominating right now. I know that. Um, but I'm, I'm a diehard basketball fan. And I'm from that era of Gen X where like, we watched Larry Bird and you know, Magic Johnson and all the, all the folks of the higher caliber. And everyone else is like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, Ma Magic Johnson was known for doing a lot of this. Like He would just do no-look passes and bullet passes. And it's like, how, how are these athletes using their vision? So we're talking about concussion. I also want to have a discussion about what about enhancement? We keep talking about injury. Um, if, if you want to get an athlete to engage, do not talk about rehabilitation. Talk about enhancement. They'll listen to you all day long. Right? So I don't know if John was trying to frighten me on the first day of my PhD, but he said, here's the brain. Every single box is, uh, these are all the visual parts of the brain, just the visual parts. Area MT, V5, V1, V2. And I'm looking at this going, okay, I have to study every single one of these and know what they do. And my favorite area is area MT right there in the middle, this little red box right there. Why? Because it, it processes motion. It processes motion and it's very heavily influenced by the brainstem. Now, if you look, I love this picture because the person's looking from side to side, but I always emphasize the optic nerve is not like brain tissue. It is brain tissue. Astrocytes and glial cells. If you look at an optic nerve under a microscope, it is astrocytes and glial cells. So it's literally the only part of the brain that moves, which I think is a cool statement, right? Um, 40 to 50% of the human brain is primarily visual machinery. There's the reference. It's a filament and van essence. So you literally have almost half of your brain is primarily for vision. It's the most dominant sensory system we have. I know I'm biased. I'm the eye doctor, but the anatomy is not lying, right? So, so then we look at, this is the way I explain it to my patients. So I'll say, okay, you got a camera and you got an eyeball. So here you got something in the real world. What would happen? This is back in the day before iPhones when we actually had film. Um, so you'd have the lens, you'd project the picture onto the film. Okay, fair enough. Well, the eyeball is kind of like a camera. You got an object, you got a lens in the eye, and you got, instead of the film, it lands on the retina. Well, on the top, where would you have sent the film before you could see the picture? You send it to a lab to be developed. Okay, so here's my question. Where's that developed? Of course, smart crew here, we know it's the brain. So then you go over here and you say, okay, I got an image lands on both eyes, but the image, the neural information has to pass through all those purple areas before you process what you're seeing. So over here is eyesight. So you can prescribe a pair of glasses. So for example, if I'm looking straight ahead, and I know some of you can't see me because you're very far back, but if I pick a target and I say, okay, I'm going to look here and I know that you're double. Okay. Can I make you go further apart? Can I let your shoulders touch? Can I let your ears touch? I'm going to make you go further apart. I'm going to look at your left image. Now I'm going to make the left image move. You see my right eye? I can feel it. I'm an isotrope now. I'm going to bring it back. I'm going to look at the other image. I'm going to move the other eye now. I'm an isotrope in the other eye now. I'm going to bring it back. Who's in charge of the system? Brain. Did that have anything to do with glasses? No. Okay, so if I have a brain injury, why are we shocked 
that there's visual problems that don't show up as a prescription problem. I can still see 2020 on the eye chart. 2020 is 20th century eye care. Ooh, that sounds good. So hopefully, again, if it was a bigger screen, this would look better. But if, if, you, get, if you watch this person reading, so he's going to read 2020 on the eye chart. And watch his eyes. Do his eyes move? Can you turn up the volume there for me? There's no volume coming out. There we go. So I'm going to start that one again just so we have the volume. Here we go. Read the 2020 line. So now watch his eyes. O-R-U-F-A. So did you see his eyes move? No. He blinked, but the eyes didn't really move. You're reading five letters on an eye chart 20 feet away. So 2020... There's a more complicated way to explain this. I'm going to say it in an easier way. 2020 is basically, I can see size 20 font 20 feet away, right? So if I have five of my letters on the eye chart that are separated by this much, I don't have to move my eyes very much, correct? Okay, here he is while he's reading. So he's reading in his head. Well, watch his eyes. Oh, video's jerky for some reason. There we go. So you can see the eyes move. Okay, I'm going to show. I'm going to go back and show that one again because that was. Okay, so if you can read the 2020 line for me there. So the 2020 o line. R U F A. We know that the eyes didn't really move. Now we're going to go to the next one. So if you can read the first. And he's paragraph. reading in his head. Watch his eyes. So you can clearly see the eyes are moving, right? So what I'm basically showing there is. So the question then is, does 2020 tell you anything about how the eyes move? Of course, the answer is no. Okay, so why is it the standard? What do I do in sports? What do I do when I'm driving? What do I do when I'm reading? I move my eyes. Yet we're not assessing it. Like the most daftest thing that we do as eye doctors is we put a patient in a static chair, get them to look at a static target, and then tell them everything's fine, and then we send them out into a dynamic world where they move and their eyes move. Think about that for a second. Is the definition of just not smart. So low resolution thinking. It's a polite way to say it. So this is a paper we published in a medical journal uh, in 2013, and this was looking at children who were not necessarily concussion, but they were having trouble with reading. Right, And we had 50 controls, 50 IEPs, cool piece of kit. You got a four infrared cameras on the bottom. And on the top is the, a sample from the control group. So you kind of see the red dot is where the eyes are moving in real time. So this is control. And then you get some numbers. So this person's moving their eyes 96 times to read 100 words, um, three regressions per 100 words. So they're going back occasionally. We all, we all kind of do that from time to time. On the bottom is typically what we saw in the group that had trouble with reading. And you see a lot of back and forth. By the way, we hear a lot of this from our concussion folks too. They don't like to read, scroll on computer screens, reading is hard, I can't retain what I read. We hear that a lot. And if you look at the numbers over here, it's 448 eye movements on the bottom to read 100 words. 145 regressions. So then on top of that, if you have accommodative problems, which is sustaining near focusing, what you'll have is the print coming in and out of focus as the tracking's also off. So go figure why these people cannot retain what they've read, right? So. Uh, Brendan, I'm going to pick on you for a second. So I'm going to pull up something here. Can you read that from the top? Go ahead. Keep, come on now, keep going. Hard, isn't it? Right? How, if I forced you to read all of that to the bottom, how much of that do you think you'd actually retain? Okay, what do we hear all the time from our patients? I can't retain anything I read. I feel... Right. Okay, so... Again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these because I know we want to have the research, but the research is out there. This is Christine Masters. This was published in 2016. She took 100 adolescents who'd had concussions, and what, you, what did she find? Easier way to look at this is a Venn diagram. If you add up those numbers between three of the most common eye-focusing, eye-tracking, eye-teaming, 69 out of 100 had at least one of those three. 14 out of 100 had all three. This is between the age of 11 and 17. Then, uh, Dr. Hutchison, is he in the room? I saw him on the speaker schedule. Is he here? Okay. So we actually published a paper. That's cool. We, we actually published a paper together. Um, this was in 2017 as well. And what we found is we took healthy, healthy athletes who may or may not have had concussions in the past but were cleared to play. And what did we find? About 10 to 20% of them, depending on what you looked at, had deficient eye teaming, eye focusing, eye tracking skills. Right? Interesting. And then when you did a questionnaire on them, their symptom scores were higher. And we'll get to the questionnaire. So it's not like these people aren't um, in need of help. Again, I'm not going to go through this in detail. This is from UPMC in Pittsburgh. What I want to highlight is there's different vectors of injury and concussion. The further up and to the left you are, the more common the complaint is. The second one in, marked with the asterisk, is vision. So the most common complaints are migraine related. The next one is your vision, and then neck comes after that. So neck is up there. And by the way, most concussion cases, in my opinion, neck and vision are your two key places. I'm not saying the other areas are not important. What I'm saying is those are usually the two key places that you have to address. 
especially neck with your vagus nerve. If your SEMs get contracted, your head goes forward. I know I lived it, right? So this is kind of cool. So my wife thinks I'm a big kid, and she's probably right. Because if you go to Niagara Falls, there's a um, there's a, a, a kind of a fun area that you can go through. There's a Ripley's, believe it or not, at the base of the falls. And you go through this thing, and it's like a rotating tunnel. So as you walk through, it's rotating. And it's kind of wild, because when you, when you walk through it, you find yourself falling in the direction of the motion. So this is in slow motion. She's not a concussion patient. She's walking. It's rotating clockwise. Watch which way she falls. Interesting. And then you stop the tunnel. You go the other way. Watch what happens. Yeah, interesting. By the way, there's your peripheral vision. There's the part of your vision that you use for the acuity chart. Which one made her fall? Periphery. Oh, do you think we're underestimating the importance of that? 96% of your central visual field is for visual acuity 20, 30 or better. Let me say that a different way. 94% of your visual field has nothing to do with the eye chart. And yet 40 to 50% of the human brain is visual machinery. Do we think we should be paying more attention to visual peripheral function? Probably. So what ha what's happening in the funhouse? Okay, so you've got vestibular, proprioception, my visual system. I always think of a three-legged stool. If you take away one leg, the stool falls. Okay, so what did the funny tunnel prove? Even if, visual, even if vestibular and proprioception are working properly, which is a big if, if vision is off, it is so dominant, it will dominate the other two. That's really important to understand. How do we assess vestibular function? Do we look at eye movements with a VNG? Are we assuming the deficiency in eye movements is purely vestibular? Most of the time I think we are, but vision plays a really big role in that. And again, I'm not saying other therapies are not important because we all have our own bias in this room. But at the same time, we've got to look at the big picture. So when you look at the uh, cerebellum and the brainstem, here's a fascinating stat. 88% of the cerebellum is fully developed in the first year of life. That's phenomenal. By the way, 75% of all brain cells are granule cells in the cerebellum. What is the function of the cerebellum? It takes vision, vestibular, and proprioceptive input and puts it together. Hmm. So my model literally has an anatomical correlate to it. Um, this one we got to watch on volume. It might be a little bit loud, but if you can make sure the volume's on for this one. So, a couple of cases that we've seen. Watch these two here. Uh, these two right here. Watch what happens. This is in real time. Dad's recording this. So he falls. Kid's 16. Honor roll student. Doing well prior. No issues. Has his fall. Now, the other kid didn't do it on purpose. It was an accident. He falls. Falls backwards. Hits the head. But he rolls. So now you've got the neck involved as well. So his head's hyperextended under his butt. So about a, about a year, year and a half down the line, this kid presents to our clinic. This is him walking in. We want to make sure the volume's up now. So he's walking. Mom is holding his cane because he can't walk without the cane. So you can imagine what his school life's been like for a year and a half. Now, he has had all sorts of investigations, workups. Um, what they resorted to was, um, it's all in your head, go see a psychologist. Okay, now I want you to stop for me, and I want you to slowly turn around. Mom's going to go to your right again in case you go. And you see he's listening to the right. Slowly walk back towards the door from Now I guarantee you, every vestibular person in this room is thinking this is vestibular. Just wait, we're getting there. So what's interesting, the very first thing that gave it all away, when he closes his eyes, the right list goes away. The right li lean gets less. That's your first hint. Right? The other thing, he literally, if you bother talking, to, by the way, there's, a, there's this new thing in healthcare called talking to your patients. Um, if you ask him how the floor looks, he'll tell you the floor does not look flat. Here he is with something mysterious called yoked prisms, which everybody thinks is voodoo, but actually makes perfect sense. This is him 10 minutes later with yoked prisms on him. And by the way, I talked to somebody earlier from the, uh, the company that does ponds. I think you're tapping into the same thing. How does that feel? Better? Yeah, feels a lot better. Yeah, you think? Dead straight. Mom's wondering what we just did. She thinks we're practicing the black arts. So, so what's interesting is the goal of the yoke prisms is to help the peripheral visual system better connect with vestibular so your VOR is normalized. And I want to be clear, the point is not to keep them in the prisms. You do therapy to get them out of the prisms. You find an optometrist, somebody who's ideally an FCOVD, somebody who's U.S., and there's no equivalent in Canada, but the, they're U.S. board certified. The initials you want to look for are FCOVD. That's what you want to look for, okay? In fact, I have one here. I have an optometrist I'm mentoring who's going through the process right now, right? And she's in a different clinic to mine um, because, as the saying goes, if you make it up the elevator, send it down for somebody else, right? So here's, uh, here's the patient at the end of the VT. 
no prisms in place, doing quite well. So the goal, this is why I want to send a message of hope out there about concussion. It's not all doom and gloom. Yes. Do you feel like you're, you're leaning there? There right? is, there's a, Maybe just a there's a three times higher rate of suicide in this population group, by the way. The CMAJ stats, in 2016, there was a paper that looked at over 265,000 cases and estimated the, the prevalence of suicide was three times higher than, than now, the most damning statistic in that paper, by the way, was 50% of the patients who tragically followed through and did it successfully had visited a physician in the last week of life. So the myth that these patients are not looking for help is false. And I'm not bashing anybody in healthcare. I'm saying, look, healthcare people, I have lots of really good sports medicine docs who reach out to me and good, but I also have a lot that don't. And I, and I think the better ones kind of, they read and they educate themselves. Here's another case from a motor vehicle accident. So if you watch him, Kyle's his name, and all these patients have given per permission to be shown. He's walking, and you notice he's drifting very much to his right. His right arm is extended all the time. He's very spatially unsure on his right side. And I ask him, oh, and by the way, this is him two or three years post-injury. And you'll hear it in a second, hopefully, but I ask him to describe his vision, and it's very interesting to hear what he says. Could you imagine I drank alcohol? So he cracked a joke and said, imagine if I drank alcohol. Now watch what happens here. Sure. I'll describe what's happening with your vision right now. Um, it's, it's like everything just seems like I can't I can't focus on anything. Where did he literally just point? Okay, Periphery. Okay. Far. Same patient, same day, half an hour, fifteen minutes in. We did yoke prisms base left, three yoke prism base left. This is him within 10, 15 minutes. Oh, you, you think he tapped what, into about something? Six, four? Yeah. Yeah. Now what's interesting? This is crazy. And I want you to turn around. It's the first time he's Not walked straight in three years, around. by the way. So and then he walks to the end. The cool part is I was going to turn off the camera, but he keeps going. Wow. And he wants to try something because he has not been able to walk and turn his head while he's walking for three years. Because if he does, if he turns this way, he loses his balance and falls, right? Now, he told me after the fact, I was kind of annoyed going, I would have looked like a really bad doc if you just fell while I was sitting there with the camera recording. And the line, just slowly turn around and come back to me. And it was cool because it was spontaneous. Don't turn too quick. With this time, hold on, keep recording for a second. Yep. I'm going to look this way for half of it and then that way. Okay. And I'm not sure. Go for it. Because this way is messing me up. So. So, so why do yolk prisms have this dramatic of an effect? I think we're tapping into the peripheral system, which is ultimately going brainstem. Why does pons have a positive effect? Because it's tapping into brainstem. So it's almost like maybe it doesn't matter how we get there as long as we get there. Right? Nerves that fire together wire together. Here's, a, here's a, a kid's case that came to, this one actually ended up on CTV News, and, and Seth, I'll send you the link if you want to post it, but this one actually ended up on the news because the next door neighbor of the family was a reporter. Um, and you can see her describing how the floor looks. The floor, what are you seeing now? It's tilted. So she's describing right. the floor. So, that wasn't so you like could turn off the sound the for this just for a second because I'm just going to play it. So just watch this side by side. So on the left is her trying to walk using mom as a crutch. On the right is her on the same day within a half an hour wearing, wearing yoke prisms base right. Huge difference. Huge difference. Like so as an eye doctor, as, as, a, as a PhD vision researcher, I look at this and go, I'm sorry, I'm just going to be blunt. How the hell are we missing this? This is huge. Um, and obviously I put the papers in there. So yes, there's imaging studies. There's studies out there on vision therapy and traumatic brain injury, yes, we need a randomized clinical trial. Yes, we need a level one trial. We need all that stuff. But there are papers out there discussing this. It's not like there aren't. There are. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit towards the end of the talk as well. This is a book chapter myself and Dr. Singman. So Eric Singman is an MD, PhD out of Johns Hopkins. Him and I did a, um, a medical book chapter two years ago with about 250 pu uh, PubMed references. So for the head of Johns Hopkins, neuro-ophthalmology to reach out to me and ask me to co-write a chapter with them. That was kind of a humbling experience. Um, we also wrote a, a paper in um, neurorehabilitation, which is um, headaches and vision. So I read through the international classification of headache disorders, as you do on a Friday night with a, with a beer, and, and I'm reading through it and I'm going, vision's not mentioned at all. I found that stunning. Like you've, it's like somebody getting your car fixed, like we're just going to ignore half the engine. That's insanity. So um, and Dr. Singman really gave a shout out to the optometric community and really kind of gave a, a shout to the optometric com community to step up more. 
And I think that was awesome to hear because what I love about Dr. Singman is he's, I don't care who fixes the patient, somebody fix the patient, right? Um, and I think we all kind of deal with this a lot where it's like, we all have our air, there's so many different vectors that you can look at in concussion. There's the six main ones, but, and the answer is it's all important, but how do we figure out which way to go? And this is a, a modification of impact that I just use in my office. And this is basically talking about the six vectors. You fill out a questionnaire. It gives you a score in each one of the six columns. So at least it gives you an idea which one is, which one's the one that's, which one's the fire that's burning the most, right? Now, again, I still stick to my original statement of vision and neck are usually two critical areas that you have to address early on because yes, vestibular therapy is important, but if you're doing VRT like this or like this, and I see two thumbs on my neck SMS, good luck in that working. That's not going to go so well, especially if they're a migrainer. Because by the way, migrainers have abnormal velocity storage mechanism in the vestibular system. So if they run on a treadmill and they get off a treadmill and we feel like we're moving for a couple of seconds, a migrainer feels like they're moving for a couple of minutes, if not hours. So it's not the same vestibular system. Okay. Um, the other one you can do is the BIVS. This is the Brain Injury Vision Symptom Survey, which you can give to a patient. It gives you an idea of their symptom score. It's a 0 to 112 scale. Anything over 31 is a problem, but it breaks it up by area like light sensitivity, peripheral vision. So this is just good just to get an idea of what's going on with the patient. Um, so does more research need, need, need to be done? Of course it does, uh, but I'm going to point something out. And I came across this in a Cochrane review. Um, they looked at over 154 routine medical interventions. And, I'm, and I'm, to be clear, I'm not saying these interventions should not be done. I'm just pointing something out. What did they say? Only 9.9% .9 of them, so 15 out of 154 I interventions had high enough quality evidence in the literature to justify their use. Okay, let's think about that for a second. And I'm an evidence person. I love evidence. I love RCTs. I love all that stuff. But if we're going to be purists, that means we have to stop 90% of what we're doing in the medical world tomorrow. Um, so you can't be on both sides of the fence. So again, back to my point of it's the clinicians that we need to be speaking to more. Not that we shouldn't be looking at research. We should be, but we need to be talking to, to the clinicians because they're the ones with the patient in their chairs. They're the ones that are figuring out what works and what doesn't work. And the research will catch up in time and it should catch up. I'm not saying it shouldn't, but we need to figure the patient is in the chair looking for help now. Um, if you haven't read this book, you should, this is called Outlive. Peter Atia has this. It's a new bestseller, and it's an awesome book. He talks about medicine 3.0. And what he means by that is the third philosophical shift has to do with our attitude towards risk. In medicine 3.0, our starting point is the honest assessment and acceptance of risk, including the risk of doing nothing. And I love that last statement, including the risk of doing nothing. Okay? So this is a paper that was published on a football team. This is in Cincinnati. And what they did is they took two groups of football teams, they separated them, and they did proactive vision therapy on one group and not the other. Interesting approach. What did they find? The metric they used was player seasons. So you got to wrap your head around that. But in the treated group, they found 1.4 concussions um, per 100 player seasons. In the untreated group, 9.2 concussions per 100 player seasons. Oh, so you mean we can actually reduce the incidence of con concussion by trying to get ahead of it? And if you couch in the language of visual enhancement, the athletes love doing it because they think they can get an edge over their competitors. Perfect. So like, why are we playing catch up in concussion? The best way to deal with concussion is to prevent it in the first place. Um, why are we waiting for injury to occur? If I owned a Ferrari, I would keep it in tip top shape, not wait for it to break. Why on earth do we not do the same thing for the visual system in amateur and professional sports? And by the way, how many people here would agree with me if I say, by, just by a show of hands, the patients that land in your chair, it's not their first concussions. Three, four, five, six. The average, by the way, here's a damning statement on the visual system. Patients on average, and we've tracked it in our clinic, patients in our clinic don't get to us on average till five to six years post-injury. Years. And we're still getting results like that with a prism. Can you imagine if we got to them within a year? So... Mental health, and I'm going to get to the, to the positive stuff because as, as Ryan and Seth bef says, said before, I, I love sports. Sports is, is awesome. But what you're seeing is significant increased risk of, of, of self-harm in children after concussion. And again, I want to emphasize untreated concussion, but they don't say that in the papers. And this is the CMAJ paper from 2016 that talks about the three times higher rate of suicide, but again, untreated. So these patients are having these tragic statistics untreated. We need to get to the treatment point. So I'm going to get to the, to the fun stuff. Here's my thoughts on how to balance risk and sport, right? Ultimately, we cannot raise our youth in 
in bubble wrap, nor should we. In fact, this is detrimental to the long-term mental health of our children. However, it is our duty to ensure that we have an objective, reliable, and universally usable way of showing that it is safe for our kids to engage in sports. It is our societal responsibility as parents and adults to ensure that our youth are cleared confidently, not just to be able to play, but also to thrive in sports and have them on the field in tip-top shape. So here's some papers. And again, I won't go through them in detail, but these basically show that sports have immense value in terms of mental health. Having children, this actually compared team sports versus individual sports and, and showed a significant increase in benefit in mental health of people who play team sports over individual sports, which makes sense because there's a sense of camaraderie, you're, 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 you're with your teammates on the, on the field. This then looks at any sport compared to no sport and says, yep, immense value. So we need to not take the mantra as, as you know, Seth said this morning that we're not saying don't play sports, we love sports. What we're saying is how can we keep people in sports? How can we keep them functioning in tip-top shape? Somebody gets injured, and if it's their second, third, fourth concussion, is there a way that we can take these players out for a little bit of rehabilitation or enhancement after a first hit if we can detect that there's a problem? As we said, at the University of Toronto, we found that there was 10 to 20% of the athletes that were healthy were showing deficiencies. So I'm like, mm, I, that's an area for, that's an opportunity for improvement. Um, this is something that I'm working on. This is kind of, this has been my life side thing, but I'm, I'm, I'm looking at pupils and eye movement. So this is more um, objective ways of determining damage to the visual system. Um, you can't fake a pupil reflex last time I checked. So we're looking at pupil reactions. And what's really interesting about the pupils is this is actually the, this is not a, a, an instrument that doesn't exist. You can see from the bottom, it's in existence. We have it as a prototype. We're putting it through validation phase right now. Um, I'm not going to say who with or anything. It's a, I was actually hard pushed to even show this today because as you can imagine, this is kind of under, under wraps right now. But what I'm trying to do is, is figure out a truly objective ways that it doesn't matter if I run the test or you run the test or Brendan runs a test, um, you're going to get the same results. So we can at least have a cross-disciplinary way of determining status and progress. Are they actually getting better, right? And again, I'm not saying this is going to be the only thing. There's, there's lots of other instruments out there, and good, we need more objective things. So remember, we're dealing with people. This is a 15-year-old that came to us. She's 21 now, so we're going to jack up the volume over there if we can. Volume, yep. So I'm just going to put, put the vo volume up here. So this is a kid that we got. She's had numerous concussions playing soccer. This is her at the end of her therapy. Just checkpoint after you graduated from VT, so I think we graduated you from vision therapy about four months ago, five months ago. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you feel now compared to when you first came to see us? Um, absolutely night and day. I was a university student who could, you know, couldn't even go to my university community center without actually throwing up because of the visual stimulus was just so overwhelming to now I can drive down the highway, I can listen to music when I'm driving, I can, I feel like I'm a normal person again. Headaches. Talk to me about those. Yeah, so I used to get headaches all the time, probably like five days a week, at least something, and I would get really bad migraines to the point where like I couldn't function. Versus now, I think I've had like one headache or one migraine in like four months. So okay. like I I can function normally again. Awesome. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about the initial assessment that we did with you? I think I think your mom came with you to that, right? Yeah. So both my parents came with me for that. Um, this is my fourth or fifth concussion, so I've had lots of different assessments, I've seen lots of different doctors, and I couldn't put into words what was going on with my eyes and in my head, and so no one really could understand what was what I was saying was the issue, um, and the way that you, Dr. Quaid, put it into words and like showed my parents how my eyes were functioning, it made them understand what was going on with me, as well as you put into words what I was feeling and couldn't put into words, and we actually, we left the appointment, and my mom just gave me a hug, because she was like, I'm so sorry, like I had no idea that this is this is actually what, what's been going on. And like, you've been seeing all these things that shouldn't be happening. And how are you feeling now? So, so think about that from a mental health standpoint, right? Patients not feeling validated that my symptoms are real. So this is, and I want to give a shout out. I'm going to embarrass you, Brendan. You're sitting in the front row. So Brendan Mooney, put your hand up. Um, so Brendan's worked with, uh, with the Leafs and the Marleys. And what have I learned from my journey so far, just to wrap things up? So myself and Brendan, um, the very first thing I've learned is Work with other people who make you better. The difference between an average clinician and an excellent one is that the excellent one gets others involved and does not let their ego get in the way. I, I really want to bring that up because this is a wonderful book, Ego is the Enemy. Um, and what Ryan Holiday talks about, and this is 100% true, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, your worst enemy already lives inside of you, your ego. 
it's not about us. It's about the patients. And I know that sounds like a line, but it's 100% true. I, I like to bring other people in if I know they're really going to help move things along faster. Um, and this is Larry Fitzgerald. So those of you, probably most people in the football world will recognize who Larry is. Arizona Cardinals 2008. So it was, there, there were the West champions. He's a wide receiver. He literally says, optometric vision therapy made a big difference in my life and my career. I was fortunate that my vision problems were caught early in life. Learning related vision problems can have a serious impact on a child's education. Don't wait, take action. He literally has it. We have his plaque in our office. He's, he's a big proponent of VT. Um, and I don't know if you've ever um, heard Theodore Roosevelt. I'm not going to read that whole thing right now, but he's got, he's got a speech called The Man in the Arena. And if you ever get a chance to read it, re read it. And what he's talking about is, if I were to summarize his speech into one sentence, it would be, don't take advice from people, sorry, don't take critique from people you wouldn't go to for advice. Find a mentor who's willing to spend time and effort teaching you and let them pour their knowledge into you and use that for the benefit of your patients. Um, there's also a QR code on there. Uh, if anyone wants to scan that, I'll leave it up. But it's the full version of this lecture that I gave last year at the, uh, the brain, there was a brain and ocular nutrition conference in Cambridge in the UK last year. And the University of Cambridge were kind enough to ask me to come over and be a keynote speaker. And you'll laugh at this. First time in my life I ever flew first class because it was a long flight. And it's destroyed me because now I get on a plane and I'm like, every time I'm just, I'm slopping it back to coach, right? But um, they were really kind. They invited me over to speak. So that QR code will take you right to the lecture online. They were kind enough to record it. So if any of you want to watch the full lecture, I'll leave that up. So I will leave it there. Thank you for giving me the time. I, I appreciate it.